Good morning, or is it good afternoon, everybody? It's a, a great pleasure to be here today at this conference, and can I begin with an apology? We have a distinguished visitor from India coming to Parliament later on today, so all the roads have been closed, uh, and we need to be able to get back before they close us out of Parliament. Uh, so that's why I've asked the organisers to change the schedule slightly, but I really did want to come and address this conference. Can I commend the Muslim Council for Britain for organising this very, very important conference? Uh, looking at the title itself, Terrorism and Extremism, How Should British Muslims Respond? This is a watershed moment, not just for the community, but I think also for your organisation. Therefore, tackling this subject being able to discuss it in an open and frank way is, I believe, the very first response one should make. It's a pleasure to follow David Anderson. Uh, David is the nearest of God as far as parliamentarians are concerned. Uh, any discussions on counter-terrorism, everyone always agrees with what David Anderson has said because he's clearly someone without an agenda someone who is widely respected in Parliament and outside. And he's come with you with some very important facts and figures. Because one thing about David's reports is that he's very clear and he's very frank and he's very transparent. And he's always evidence-based. So I'm happy to say, even though I came in, in the middle of his speech, that I am pleased to adopt all the facts and arguments that he has put forward. Because I know they're right because they're coming from him. Politicians are different, of course. Uh, we seek evidence, we uh, try and put our opinions forward, and that's why this conference comes at the right time as far as the Home Affairs Select Committee is concerned. I've now chaired this body for uh, around about eight years. We've looked at the issues of terrorism before, indeed, our last report, uh, Counter Terrorism and Foreign Fighters, um, was our last attempt to look at this very important subject. We are currently involved in a very big uh, inquiry called Counter-Terrorism the Counter-Narrative. Because whenever politicians, whoever they are, from the Prime Minister downwards, speak about this issue, they always say it is the community that has the answers. But we can only do so much. At the end of the day, it is the community that must produce the response. So I'd like to take on that theme with you in the short time that I will be speaking, and seek ways to explore how that can be done. First of all, I believe very strongly that if you ask the community to find answers, then you must put the community in the driving seat in order to find solutions. Far too often, politicians will announce solutions and then expect everyone to follow. I believe, and I think the committee feels very strongly about this, that it is up to the community itself to frame a package of measures and an alternative strategy. Because it is very clear to me, even though we've just started this inquiry, and I want to thank the MCB for coming to give evidence, we called you first amongst our very first witnesses because we felt that we had to hear from you first. <coughs> the important point is that if you put the community in the lead, you must then look to community solutions. Now, I think this is a defining moment for the British Muslim community and the wider Asian community as well, but it's particularly important for the British Muslim community. And you represent mosques and other organisations from all over the country. I am delighted to see Leicester always very well represented at our deliberations, um, because I think it's important because my home city of Leicester, where, as you know, uh, we describe ourselves as a city of festivals, there are some times when I believe this is a constant thing in Leicester. We're either uh, finishing uh, Ramadan, uh, celebrating Eve, going into Basaki, celebrating uh, the birth of Guru Nanak, um, having Diwali celebrations, and now, of course, it's Happy New Year before we move on in December to Christmas. So, yes, it is a festival city, but it's also a city where communities have been able to come from all parts of the world and live together 
in harmony. And that's why I'm very pleased that when they have a list of those areas that they're concerned about, that Leicester is actually not one of them. I don't believe we have all the solutions. I don't believe that every single president of every single mosque in Leicester agrees with the other. How wonderful that would be. Or that every community organisation feels that they're doing the right thing. But the important aspect of this is that you're, ever, you're able to have a dialogue with people and you're able to try and construct that alternative. So although in our inquiry, and I'm trying not to give you conclusions before we've even started the process around the country, I hope in our inquiry that you will take the lead. That's why the MCB was first. That's why next week we don't have talking heads and men in grey suits, dark grey suits. We will have David Anderson at the end because we have David Anderson and the ministers right at the end. We decided to start the other way around. So we have people who are not very famous, but people who have um, solutions that we think are useful. And we want to start a big conversation with the Muslim community so that you can tell us what you think should happen. And we have meetings planned in Birmingham, in Leicester, of course, in Manchester, but also in Bradford. Because unusually, for a select committee of the House of Commons, we have two Muslim women who happen to sit on the Home Affairs Select Committee, both from different parties, both with very different politics. But I'm going to look to them because they share a common heritage and others to help us ensure that we have that strategy. So I said to Naz Shah yesterday, who's the MP for Bradford and is hosting us in Bradford, she said, I can, I can have a meeting and I can have a thousand people there. And I said, I'm sure you can, Naz. But actually, I prefer to have a much smaller meeting and I want to talk to young people. Because far too often in these discussions and these debates, we talk about it, those of us who've reached the ripe old age of, uh, I'll say, 45, uh, to, be, to be charitable to those here, plus. But actually, the people who really do have the answers are those younger than us. Why are we worried about our young people? Because we are. I got very worried when I heard that three girls had gone from Bethnal Green and ended up by Istanbul in Syria. So we call the parents in to give evidence to us, to ask them what they knew and how this happened and what they regarded as being the crucial issue, the tipping point, which the Prime Minister himself has talked about. What turns a young British citizen who has had the benefits of living in this, what I regard as the greatest country in the world, and suddenly decides they want to leave their parents, in some cases, as we heard in, in uh, Dewsbury, leave their husbands, or leave their mothers and fathers if they're young men or women, and go all the way to Syria to fight in a conflict that they really are not any part of. So we have them to give evidence, and um, very shortly we will be having the school to give evidence, the academy where they were taught. I went to see two young men who had come back from Istanbul, who went from Brent, who chose not to be the subject of a publicity world win. And I sat in their front room after they came back, on the Monday after they'd been returned from Istanbul, and I asked these two young men, why did they go in the first place? And they gave me explanations about reading about what Britain was doing for the tragedies that was occurring in Syria, and they felt that they should play a part in trying to bring that to a solution. And anyway, it was a Friday. They knew where their passports were. It was half term, and they really didn't think anyone was going to miss them. I'm paraphrasing, but very simply, it didn't seem to be a fundamental reason why they decided to leave everything to score parents and go via Barcelona to end up in Istanbul. That was a success story for our um, agencies. They managed to find them and they managed to bring them back. 700 plus were not in that position. And I think the challenge for all of you, and I'm going to put you at the centre, because I think you need to be at the centre, and this organisation needs to be at the centre of the conversation, is to devise that alternative strategy. Yet another conference with, even though very distinguished uh, speakers, is not enough 
unless you leave a legacy. Now I see my friend Dal Babu, who is a commander in the Metropolitan Police. Dal I regard as one of my advisors and in my role as chairman of the Home Affairs Select Committee. I hope that doesn't damn his career. But Dal is able, for the experience of being a senior police officer, one of our very few ethnic minority police officers at that level, to be able to go out into the community and work with communities in order to address these issues. We have excellent evidence from the East London Mosque, one of the largest mosques uh, in Europe. Hearing from the press officer, hearing from um, the woman who leads the uh, women's projects there, and others. These are the people who I think should help us. We will wring our hands and we will call for bold action. We will talk about allocating even more money. But it really does matter where that money goes, who, who receives it, how can it be put to the benefit of the community, but more importantly than anything else, how it can be put to the benefit of our country. Because if we do not do that, then the future is very bleak. I think that the numbers are going up. Every time we have uh, Sir Bernard Hogan have before us and we ask him, well, what are the figures now of those who have gone? They are increasing. When you talk to colleagues, as I do all across Europe, um, they say to us, well, you know, Britain thinks 700 have gone. Wait till you hear how many have gone from France and how many have gone from Germany. Even bigger totals. Why is this happening? And that is why you will find us in Parliament at the Home Affairs Select Committee very open to your discussions and to your solutions. Because if you hold this conference and you don't come up with a legacy plan, and if you don't come up with concrete solutions, then you will have a position where government will always think they know best. And I have to tell you, in this case, Government does not know best. I do not know best. David Anderson, with all his skills and ability, he does not know what is best in order to deal with this problem. Only you have the answers. And unless you come out with those solutions, you will always have people speaking for you. Let me say this finally. I know in the Muslim community that there are many voices. And this is not North Korea. We expect many voices. How awful to have a community and a country and a religion where you only have one voice. You know, that would be terrible. For many years, Iqbal was the uh, um, Secretary General of this organization. He's been followed by many other distinguished people. Um, they will tell you how difficult it is to bring unity over issues. And that is, that is the job of someone in a position like this that you need to bring people together and you need to find a consensus. But you know what we need to do more than anything else is to be united. And I say this to someone who came to this country at the age of nine as a first generation immigrant, born in Yemen, a country that has now been torn asunder by Singapore <coughs> and Al-Qaeda and uh, Daesh and so many other groups, without a government functioning in summer, with bombing of people happening on a hourly and daily basis. I came from that country with the stability of this country. We exercised our rights as British citizens to come here. And of course, first from my knowledge of, of Yemen, but also from my knowledge of Leicester, and my 28 years in Parliament, it is always difficult to get unity, because there are always different voices. But I urge you all to support this organization as the legitimate voice of the Muslim community. Not an exclusive voice, not an exclusive voice, because there will always be others. Some of my imams at Leicester will feel that they know better and they're entitled to do so, because they tell me so. But this is a legitimate body built with the support of the Muslim community over many years. Don't let people challenge your legitimacy and make you feel you have you cannot speak up, you have to speak up. If you don't, the vacuum will be filled by others and we will regret it for the rest of our lives. Thank you very much for listening.